Good morning and welcome everyone to um, our, our Fraser of Allender webinar. Um, we're just going to give it another minute or so for everybody to join because the numbers are still pouring in um, and then we'll get started. Thanks. Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to uh, this latest uh, Fraser of Allender webinar. Um, my name is Mary Spowage, and I'm the interim director of the um, Fraser of Allender Institute. Um, if you're anything like me, um, you'll be quite exhausted after quite a turbulent week at Holyrood. Um, um, but obviously, it's the last day of the current session today. And um, as of, of tomorrow, um, Parliament will go into its pre-election recess and that will be the end of, of session five of, of, of um, the Holyrood Parliament. So um, we, um, we need to sort of kick off our, our series of election analysis, which will include a number of articles and podcasts over the next six weeks, which will hopefully keep you interested and informed on what's going on in the kind of economic side of the debate um, and what the main issues are that are being discussed. Um, and we wanted to kick it off with something um, special. Um, so we um, asked our, our colleague, Professor Sir John Curtis, to join us to tell us a wee bit about what the, the latest polls are telling us um, about um, voting intentions um, and what, what voters might be thinking about when they're going to the ballot box. So just before I hand over to John for the stuff that you're really here for, um, I'm just gonna do um, a wee bit about what the, the latest is on the economic and fiscal context um, what the latest public health data is telling us um, and what we think are the main economic issues that might be covered in the campaign. There are obviously a number of different issues um, that could be covered um, and maybe we'll get some questions about that today um, but we're just picking out a few highlights that we think will definitely feature. Now um, as usual if you're familiar with the Zoom webinar you can ask questions um, of the panel. So after John and I speak um, some of the senior team for the Institute will be joining me for that. Um, and I'll be putting questions to, to John and, and um, the guys from the Fraser. So please put questions in the Q&A whenever you would like during our, our speak, us speaking, um, and we'll get around as many of them as possible. Now there are lots, <laughs> there are hundreds of people on this call today, so apologies if we don't get to your question because I'm expecting quite a lot, but we'll do our best to get around them. So just to kick off before I hand over to John, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the economic context that we're in. So obviously the Scottish economy has been through a really turbulent year, um, unprecedented is generally used um, and, it, and it's a word that's definitely fitting in this context. Um, the contractions that we saw in the economy during um, uh, March and April last year um, were huge um, by historical standards. Um, we've seen some recovery obviously during the summer months as things were able to open up again for recovery to flatten off and um, during the autumn. Um, at the end of last year, um, in December 2020, we were sitting at the Scottish economy around 7% below pre-pandemic levels, which was slightly worse than the equivalent data at the UK level. Um, we've seen data from the UK um, for January, which shows a contraction as we might have expected given there's been further lockdowns. And there's actually data published today for, um, for Scotland, to see what, what, um, what's happened in January in Scotland as well. Um, so look out for us commenting on that um, later in the week. One of the key um, characteristics of this economic crisis has been the sexual disparity of its impacts. Um, the hospitality industry, so this is, by this we're talking about accommodation and food services, so pubs, restaurants, cafes, hotels, has been severely impacted. Um, and you know, despite the fact it was able to recover a little bit during the summer, by the end of the year, it was still sitting at about 40% of, of pre-pandemic levels. 
you can see, you know, um, in contrast to that, um, areas like financial insurance uh, services were able to kind of continue um, fairly um, routinely, um, although a lot of people were working at home um, throughout the pandemic. Um, and other industries such as manufacturing and construction took a big hit initially, but have managed to adapt quite well to, to lockdown restrictions and, and during the most recent lockdown have mostly been able to operate. You can see as well that there's a bit of a bounce in manufacturing towards the end of the year um, as people were um, generally stockpiling a bit before um, we exited the EU transition period at the end of December. But what about the outlook? Um, We've just published uh, last week a number of scenarios for the Scottish economy. Um, our central scenario has um, the economy returning to pre-crisis levels in October 22. So that's two and a half years after the start of the pandemic. Um, and then we think there'll be you know, fairly decent growth in 2021, but it's really in 2022 when we're really going to see growth starting to motor, given that it's right likely to be sluggish for the first half of this year. Other forecasters have got a different view. The Scottish Fiscal Commission recently published a forecast at the end of January for quite a very, a very muted forecast in 2021, um, mostly due to a contraction, obviously, in the first half of the year, um, but with a healthy growth in 2022. And the OBR are much more optimistic, and they think there'll be 4% growth for the UK in 2021, uh, and then 7.3% in 2022. I think what I would take away from this is that things are very uncertain about the outlook. Um, you know, whatever the OBR say, they're quite clear that their, their forecasts are very uncertain right now. And it's very difficult to know what might happen next um, with the vaccine programme, with the restrictions that we might need and with government support mechanisms and how long those go on for. Talking about government support mechanisms, there have been absolutely huge levels of support in, by historic standards from the government to support jobs and the economy. So this chart shows a budget deficit, um, a monthly budget deficit that we can see. Um, and we're on course for a record 350 billion deficit at the UK level this year. Um, throughout all this spending, of course, and a number of, a number of the schemes have been by the UK government um, for the whole of the UK. So things like the job retention scheme or the furlough scheme. But there's also been a number of business support schemes paying money directly to businesses through the business rate system and other grant systems. Um, which have generated huge consequentials for the Scottish budget. And largely, although there's been some differences, they've been spent in broadly the same way in supporting individuals and businesses to sort of survive through the crisis when they've had restricted um, hours of operating or ways of operating um, or had to shut altogether. But there is huge uncertainty over the outlook um, for um, the, the UK budget. What's going to happen next will be the spending review in the autumn, which will tell us a bit more about that. Um, and given the uncertainty over the economic conditions that we're looking at over the next few years, that just compounds the uncertainty over what the, the sort of fiscal um, position might be. The latest public health context, um, this is a chart from the Public Health Scotland um, um, daily update, which is a, an amazing source of information. Um, and it's a, it's a very impressive resource that was put up quite quickly. Um, the latest data is showing a test positivity rate of 3.5%, which is much lower than, than we've had and been used to um, as a new strain was discovered towards the end of last year. Um, you know, the numbers on, on deaths and, and, um, and people who have become ill are just so mind boggling um, that we can't get desensitized to them. We, we have around 7,500 um, COVID confirmed deaths in Scotland. There's more on the wider measure that's used on, on the weekly deaths. Um, but they are much lower than they have been and they're at, a, at quite a low level now. But every one of these deaths obviously is another person that's come to this horrible virus. On the good news side, 49% of those aged 16 plus have now received their first vaccine dose, which is unbelievable. <laughs> um, you know, if we thought about that um, when before these vaccines were approved at the beginning of December um, and around 5% have had their second dose. So in terms of all of that um, context, what does that mean for the, the election campaign to come? Um, it sets the scene for a very different election campaign. You know, we'll, we'll obviously not have um, so many people, we would think, knocking on our doors as we would normally do, which might be a relief for some. Um, <clears throat> but one of the first things that we're going to feature quite highly, we think, 
is around economic recovery and how we recover from this, this terrible economic crisis, which has been caused by the restrictions that we've had to put in place to protect public health. We know that many inequalities in our society have been exacerbated by the pandemic and that the long-term challenges we had as an economy and a society haven't gone away. So climate change, our aging society, none of that has gone away. So discussion on the type of recovery is likely to feature um, looking at poverty and inequality and those things that have been exacerbated. For example, we have quite challenging child poverty targets in the next parliament that are statutory and they're now set in legislation. Of course, tackling climate change. And we've got COP26 uh, later in the year uh, in Glasgow. And so it's likely to feature quite highly. What is the role for the green recovery here? And how can we, we both further our climate change ambitions and also stimulate economic recovery? What about reforms or changes to social care? Um, there was a large review of social care, the Feely Review, um, which had various recommendations. How might parties respond to that? And what might their proposals be for grasping the nettle of how we fund and deal with social care in the future, given our aging population. And of course, young people have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Um, there's been huge disruption to education, both um, at school and further in higher education. And how do we support young people through education and into the labour market to ensure that there isn't long-term scarring uh, in our economy and labour market? Economic issue number two is about the use of fiscal powers. Um, it's worth remembering that since 2016, significant financial powers have been devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Um, we now have much more power over income tax, the rates and bans, and a new system has been introduced um, in 2018-19. It is a more progressive system, more tax is taken from the top end of the distribution. Um, so that's a big change. Um, so we would expect, I guess, to see the party setting out how they might change the income tax system or um, use these powers to um, to, to further their own goals. Um, there's new social security powers, which would off fully by next year, but there's been various things that have already been done, including the introduction of, of the Scottish child payment. Um, but a number of dis disability and age related um, benefits are being devolved to Scotland. Um, so it may be that we'll see proposals for changing those or, or, or making the criteria different for, for receiving them. There have been challenges with the devolution of these powers. Things like the devolution of your passenger duty has been sort of caught up in state aid issues. So it'll be interesting to see how that's resolved um, given we've now left the EU. Um, and um, the assignment of VAT, which was planned, I think, initially for 1920, although I may be wrong, um, or uh, certainly by 2021, um, that's been delayed because of issues around measuring VAT receipts in Scotland. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens next with, with that particular um, initiative. Related to that is a fiscal framework review in 2021, which might sound like quite a techie thing, um, but it's really important actually, because it might change the way the Scottish budget is calculated and how our collection of devolved tax interacts with the money that we get um, in the block grant from Westminster. There's obviously the debate that continues about the issues with council tax um, and non domestic rates or business rates has an uncertain future with the debate raging continually about taxing premises who, um, who operate or businesses that operate in a more traditional way with bricks and mortar rather than online um, and how we maybe change that going into the future. There's a debate raging as well about UK government spending in devolved areas in Scotland such as through the levelling up scheme um, and the debate may continue over um, Barnet and how it operates and how much funding um, we get in Scotland um, compared to other parts of the UK and if this system is still fit for purpose. There's also likely to be a wider discussion about fiscal consolidation at the UK level. So when do we pay back some of the debt that we, we built up over the course of the pandemic when we already had quite a high debt burden to begin with? And what could that mean for the Scottish budget? And of course, we can't get away from the constitution. <coughs> in some ways, in terms of the, the main economic battlegrounds, it will be similar to 2014. Those who are in favour will argue that Scotland is, is comparable to other successful independent countries. Scotland is a rich and successful nation in, in international terms. That this would provide opportunities to do things differently and make a contrast with the economic policy decisions that Westminster might make. 
Those against independence will argue that there are many benefits from pooling and sharing of resources across the UK, including the high levels of public spending that we have in Scotland. Um, that there are lots of risks from transition to whatever our new independent Scotland would be. And also that, that now is not the time, um, which um, is, is likely to feature, particularly because we're coming out of an economic crisis. But at the same time, so much has changed, so much is different. Um, you know, in 2014, it was the choice was kind of between independence and a relatively stable status quo. That was the way we were to stay in the EU and, and all of these other things. Um, and that's just not the case anymore. So there's there's a sort of new path, sort of no matter what the people of Scotland choose, if they get the opportunity to do so. Um, Brexit has obviously sh sh thrown into sharp focus the challenge of such a, a, a large structural change to your economy and undoing ties that you have with a close trading partner. Um, so, I mean, this is likely to feature in any um, campaign around the economic consequences potentially of, of voting for independence. The economic context is very different. We've had a large economic crisis. Um, there's been a disruption caused by Brexit and all of the changes that there, there have been to our economy because of that. Um, and also things like oil revenues, obviously, which were quite a big feature in terms of the, the outlook for public finances in 2014, really don't feature anymore. <clears throat> given that they're so low now that they really um, are sort of irrelevant in terms of the outlook for um, Scottish public finances. And in 2014, it was very much a continuity case, um, but it's likely to be different this time, sorry, <coughs> in any next campaign. So that's what we think might be the, the main issues that are discussed around, um, around the economy and um, the campaign. And now I'm going to hand over to um, to our special guest, John, to talk you through what the polls are showing. And I can see that there's lots of questions coming in already. So um, that's fantastic. So um, so keep putting your questions in the Q&A function. And um, if you do that, I, um, I'll keep reviewing them and I'll be able to put them to John and the other panelists when John finishes his presentation. So. Over to you, John, and welcome, and thank you for doing this for us today. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Marie. Um, so uh, what I want to do is really perhaps to give you a chance to stand back from some of the sound and fury of Scottish politics of the last couple of months, um, and to think in particular about the ways in which the political scene in Scotland has changed since the last Scottish public election in 2016, which I will remind you took place seven weeks before the EU referendum. And an awful lot of water has um, flowed under an awful lot of bridges in uh, the subsequent time. I will then refer a little bit to uh, more immediate things, but the, the principal thing I want you to be wanting to show you is some of the ways in which this election is different from certainly the one in 2016 and indeed in some respects from other Scottish Parliament elections uh, as well. But let me start by reminding you of the trajectory of party support really, really during the course of the last uh, three years. So this is all the opinion polls conducted since um, the beginning of 2018. And I finally worked out how to, how to use the back end of to, to get the right colours for the right parties. Um, so crucial point number one, as you will note, is that the SNP, having pretty much kept on running at an, in the low 40s for um, Scottish Parliament constituency vote intentions, that's what I'm looking at here, in the wake of the UK general election and in the wake of the delivery of Brexit, um, began to rise uh, more towards the 50% mark, was above 50% for much of last year. And then as you can see on the far right hand side, however, in the last couple of months or so has fallen back down again to around um, just below the 50% mark, although you will note it is still well above what it was uh, at least until the delivery of Brexit. Um, the SNP dominate the nationalist side of the spectrum. In contrast, unionism is divided. 
a division that was played out very visibly in the Holyrood chamber yesterday. Um, the Conservatives, yes, are able to get, according to the polls, and continuously uh, slightly more popular than Labour, running at uh, somewhat over 20%. Labour persistently running behind. But as you can see, the gap now is not that great. And one of the, the uh, uh, questions about this election will indeed, which party emerges as the second party at Holyrood? Because I suspect on that will rest the decision as to which is the party that would be expected to lead the no side in the event of there being a referendum during the course of the next parliament. Um, but it is worth reflecting that um, Boris Johnson finds himself in Scotland at the opposite end of a strategic contrast that proved to be his, to his advantage in the 2019 general election and the delivery of Brexit, but is now to the marked disadvantage of him and unionism in Scotland. You'll remember in 2019 that um, we had a parliament that uh, was struggling, unwilling to back Theresa May's version of Brexit, but equally could not manage to agree about anything else. Uh, Boris Johnson took, uh, took everything by the scruff of the neck, united the Leave vote behind the Conservative Party, and thereby managed to win the election and deliver a Brexit. In meanwhile, the Remain vote was divided. In Scotland, the SM, as I'll show you, the SNP have most of it, uh, but it's south of the border between Labour and the Wood Democrats, and the Remainers could not agree amongst themselves as to what their alternative strategy should be. Notice how now we have a situation, however, where it is the nationalist vote that is largely uh, united behind one party, the SNP, and the unionist vote is denied, divided, and the unionist parties are divided in the message that they wish to convey. So it'd be interesting to see whether or not that strategic difference has a similar consequence to what it had in 2019. Liberal Democrats, meanwhile, no sign of recovering from the disaster of their involvement in the coalition between 2011 and 2015. Um, uh, there was a bit of a rise, of course, of support for the Brexit party like everywhere else in 2019, but it's largely it's disappeared. Okay, so how do we explain and understand this uh, strategic situation? Well, um, I'm going to go straight away to looking at the trends in attitudes towards independence, and I'll explain in a moment why I am going there. Um, again, starting in 2018. Um, all the way through, uh, despite na initial na nationalist expectations, the, the, the divergent outcome of the Brexit referendum uh, north and south of the border would result in a marked increase in support for uh, independence as people were upset about how Scotland's democratic wishes, quote unquote, being overturned. In practice, in, in so far as aggregate support is concerned, the immediate consequences of Brexit appeared to be minimal. So support for independence is concerned. And even through during the year of 2018, um, the green line here is no, the blue line is yes. We were still looking at roughly 55% for no, 45% for yes. Notice, however, while Parliament at Westminster was endlessly debating what should happen next about Brexit, support for independence was finally rising north of the border. The polls throughout 2019, on average, yes, 49, no, 51. And by the time we got to Brexit day, it was 50, 50. Then during the course of last year, uh, for the first time, we had a whole run of polls that continuously put yes ahead. And unionists began to wake up to the fact that the union was indeed now in peril. It has then more recently, as you can see, narrowed the blue and green lines now very close to each other. But if you take the last half dozen polls, it is yes, 50, no 50. We go into this election absolutely fundamentally divided down the middle on the, the central constitutional question that's faced this country for uh, since at least uh, the 1970s. And in that respect, at least also, of course, there is a remarkable similarity to the position vis-a-vis -vis Brexit. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, why the, why the devil is he focusing on independence as opposed to all those other really important economic and other uh, policy issues uh, that Mahi has quite rightly uh, turned uh, our attention to? Well, this is the explanation. 
the election looks as though it's going to be in practice a quasi referendum. What I'm doing here is showing you the level of support for the various parties uh, broken down by whether people are currently yes supporters or no supporters. And what you will note is that uh, uh, just under nine in 10 of those people who are current yes supporters say they will vote for the SNP and virtually nobody who is not a yes supporter is minded to do so. Meanwhile, the unionists vote, and if yes, the conservatives have most of it, but they still only have half of it. Again, there's the strategic, strategic contrast. They might be saying, that we're quite hanging on what, what, what's new about this. Surely it's always the case that, um, you know, people who vote for the SNP or are people in favor of independence and vice versa. Actually, no, this is a new position. Let me just, for example, simply show you the position back at the time of the last election in 2016, when again, we can uh, uh, divide people according to that preference in 2016. Even then, around one in five of those people who were not in favor of independence voted for the SNP in the 2016 election. And if we go back to the 2011 election, when the SNP won that very unexpected um, overall majority. Well, actually, support for independence at that stage was running between 25 and 30 percent. So there's no way that the SNP got 45 percent of the vote off the back of uh, independence voters and independence voters alone. Nearly 40 percent of those people who voted, who at that stage were in favor of keeping devolution, voted for the SNP. So we are now in a much more polarized situation in which the constitutional question does look as though it is the central issue that is shaping voters' preferences for this election. And it is really the first time that that has been the case. And it's one of the reasons why my advice to unionists has long been, uh, uh, stop arguing about process, stop presuming that you can uh, simply under, undermine support for independence by attacking the SNP. If unionists are going to, uh, to um, get the SNP vote done in this election, they actually have to win the substantive argument about independence, because at the moment, those people who are convinced of the substantive argument of independence are very, very heavily inclined to vote for the SNP. Now, you may be then saying, but why are is support for independence rise in 2019 and then subsequent gain in 2020. So how, how is it that the SNP do now have this apparent cushion of 50% of the electorate pretty much on the same side as them on the constitutional question and as a result minded to vote for the party also? Well, the short answer is that there is a very clear culprit, if that's the right word, as to why support for independence has risen. One of the uh, what I'm showing you here is the level of the support for independence, uh, not according to how people voted yes or no, because I hear I'm going back to be to before the independence referendum. Um, I'm using a different question that divides people into Eurosceptics and Europhiles. One of the ironies of the 2014 Scottish uh, independence referendum, when as we've already been reminded, the politicians spent hours arguing about whether or not an independent Scotland uh, would or would not be able to be a continuing member of the European Union. It was a complete and utter waste of breath, because in the event, as you can see here, and I could show you other data on this, there was no relationship at all between people's attitudes towards independence in 2014 and whether or not they voted yes or no. Indeed, actually, uh, if we go forward to the 2016 EU referendum, there was no relationship between whether people voted yes or no, or whether they voted remain or leave. But once the uh, Brexit referendum, and remember, so in the pre, in the in the 2016 Scottish world world of 2016 Scottish Parliament election, Brexit was not an issue so far as attitudes towards independence is concerned. Um, but you will see here, the 2016 reading here is for people after the um, uh, EU referendum, and you will then see further, 2017, 2019, increasingly people, uh, uh, Europhiles, are much more likely to be in favour of independence as Eurosceptics. Basically, there's, part, there's a resorting process going on. Some of the people who voted 
uh, uh, yes and, uh, and leave switch to no, but others who voted no and remain switch towards yes. It's just, of course, there are twice as many no remain voters in Scotland as there are yes leave ones. And then to understand how that then plays out into the rise in support uh, for independence in 2019, here is the crucial graph. This is now showing you support for independence in the polls um, uh, through various time periods from 2018 onwards. So yes, by 2018, uh, support for independence is higher amongst Remain voters and Leave voters. But notice that all of the increase in support for independence that occurred in 2019, and was still there in 2020, occurred amongst Remain voters. That's why, in my mind, there is no doubt that whatever your views about the merits or otherwise of Brexit, th that the pursuit of Brexit by the UK government is the uh, initial reason as to why support for independence uh, has risen in the way that it did. That said, what you will then notice on the right hand side, if we look at the position in 2020 or indeed now, that the subsequent rise and indeed fall in support for independence during those two periods has occurred independently of people's views on Brexit. So it's not Brexit that helps to explain the more recent uh, uh, developments. But before I try to explain those, let me now also show you the impact that this um, uh, uh, relationship between Brexit and independence has had on support for the parties. So here I'm now showing you how those who voted remain and voted leave voted in the various elections that have taken place in Scotland between 2015 and 2019. Notice that in 2015, when the SNP, of course, got nearly half the vote in Scotland, support for the party was almost as high amongst Leave voters as it was amongst Remain voters. And while the Conservatives were somewhat more popular amongst Leave voters than Remain voters, the gap was not that wide. In the 2016 election, which is the baseline for uh, this May, the SNP are as popular amongst Remain voters as they are amongst Leave voters, and the Conservative progress in that election occurs irrespective of people's views about Brexit. But then notice 2017. There is still the myth out there, often repeated by many a journalist, for which uh, I do not know any academic evidence that the reason why the SNP lost ground in the 2017 UK election was because of Nicola Sturgeon's promise a few weeks pre previously uh, to hold IndyRef 2. This is not the explanation. The explanation is that in 2017, in the wake of that resorting process I've already talked about, support for the SNP fell markedly amongst Leave voters. They largely held on to their support amongst Remain voters. It, were, it fell amongst Leave voters. And where did it go? It went to the Conservative Party. All of the progress that the Conservatives made between 2016 and 2017 occurred amongst Leave voters. And that legacy was still with us in 2019. The Conservatives get half support of half the Leave vote in Scotland. And you will notice that it's the SNP that dominate on the Remain side. And the Labour Party are just not picking up the Remain vote that they do south of the border. Um, and that's still there in the polls for this election. So now I'm comparing 2016 with the, what the polls are currently saying. Support for the SNP is up on its position uh, in the 2016 election. It is down on its position still quite markedly amongst Leave voters. And the Conservative Party, in contrast, uh, are up amongst Leave voters and down amongst Remain voters. So the truth is that this is a double existential election. It's an existential election about Scotland's uh, position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United Kingdom. It is also, although somewhat less markedly, an existential election, uh, election about Scotland's relationship with the European Union. Both of these things are playing a fundamental role in shaping support for the parties, and both, uh, both are doing so in a way that was not the case as recently as five years ago. Okay, but what about more immediate proximate matters and how do we understand the way the reason why support for independence went up and then more recently seems to have gone down again well number one i think undoubtedly a crucial part of this story is the pandemic and one of the things i've 
quietly said to quite a few journalists during the course of the whole furore is do kind of remember that while, that, while you're uh, obsessing about who said what to whom in, in private meetings uh, three years ago, uh, the rest of us are actually living on public health restrictions which dominate our lives and the management of which are probably rather more important to most of us uh, than the, uh, uh, what the, the, the conversations that were held uh, on those occasions. And one of the reasons this is, I mean, there's a lot of evidence out there and I'll show you some of it in a moment as to how um, the public feel that Nicola Sturgeon has handled the pandemic much better than Boris Johnson. But the crucial thing is, you know, why might this have an effect on people's attitudes towards independence? Well, again, and this is a, you know, a fundamental difference from previous devolution uh, elections. This the, the pandemic has been by far and away the most important public policy challenge faced, facing the devolved institutions. Um, and it's also meant that because of the public health measures have been decided in Hollywood, not in, not in London, that our lives have been dominated by decisions made by uh, uh, politicians in Edinburgh, and that's very much where our focus has been. And of course, it's also true. The UK as a whole is working up to devolution because every BBC Britain, uh, de uh, 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 bulletin has said, well, this is what Boris Johnson's decided for England, but it's not necessarily the same in the rest of uh, the UK. So given the importance of this issue to voters, given its visibility of its issue to voters, if indeed people have a perception as they have, that uh, Scotland has handled things better than has England, we might think this might have an impact on people's views about the independence question. And here's the evidence as to how during the course of last summer, it seemed to be doing so. A couple of polls found that, yes, it's only a minority of no voters, but 20% of no voters, i.e. they voted no in 2014, were saying, you know what, actually, I think Scotland might have handled the pandemic better as an independent country. And meanwhile, virtually nobody, virtually nobody, who was a yes voter uh, took the opposite view. And it looks as though, I mean, it wasn't a dramatic increase, it's just it took us past the 50% mark, but quite a lot of the increase from 50 to 53, 54% seems to have come off the back of that. And one of the things that are interesting now is that although indeed the Scottish government is still thought to be having things better than the UK government, despite uh, the UK government's attempt to claim credit for the vaccine, uh, the gap has narrowed and so also has the gap here on uh, between yes and no voters on perceptions of whether the pandemic had been handled better or worse. So that 20% figure of no voters thinking it had been handled better is now down to 16. And we do now have 9% of no voters who say, who say that it would have been uh, uh, handled uh, worse. So I think you know, uh, the, 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 the SNP will certainly argue that the, the best way after the pandemic will be independence. I think we can expect the handling of the pandemic, attempts to take credit for various ways it's being handled, et cetera, um, that, that this will also be a central issue in the election uh, because it's certainly, been, I think, played a role in people's attitudes towards independence uh, more recently. Um, all right, let me then take you to more uh, immediate matters which is how voters have reacted to the Simon Sturgeon story. Of course, it's been journalists with a, a keen interest in the story have been very keen constantly to ask, well, what impact is it having? Is it, is it, is it uh, resorting in support for, uh, for the SNP falling down? And here we have one of those um, uh, difficulties that economists like yourselves who deal with time series will be very familiar with which is that actually the phenomenon of interest, i.e. support for independence and support for the SNP was already showing signs of falling before the media, the uh, parliamentary inquiry hit the media headlines. And in fact, if you compare support for independence now in most recent polls with support for independence in January, it's basically the same. And if you, if you compare support for the SNP now with support in Germany, it's about three points lower. So it may have had some impact on the SNP support, but it's not obvious that it's been central to attitudes towards independence. But in any event, what's also is clear uh, is that Sturgeon basically won the battle vis-a-vis -vis Alex Salmon in the court of public opinion. I'm showing you here, first of all, for all voters, and then I will show you the crucial group, people who voted for the SNP in 2019, um, 
how, whether people thought that they were telling the truth. And as you will see before the, uh, the appearances of Sturgeon and Simon, rather more voters felt that Sturgeon wasn't telling the truth than were. Afterwards, more were thinking she was. Alex Simon, in contrast, basically did not, A, started off with uh, relatively few people believing him and thereafter uh, the position uh, did not change a great deal after his appearance. But then crucially amongst SNP voters, because if the, if the inquiry was going to do damage, it needed to do damage amongst those who otherwise minded to vote for the SNP. Notice a 22 point increase in the proportion of SNP voters who felt that Sturgeon was telling the truth. They basically went from don't know to yeah, I think the last is telling it right. Uh, meanwhile, an almost equivalent increase in the portion of SNP voters who think that Alex Salmond is not telling the truth. By the way, one of those little lovely footnotes of Scottish politics, Alex Salmond's popularity is now highest amongst Conservative voters. Who would have ever have thought that that would be true? Um, meanwhile, uh, equally, again, uh, data on who do you believe? Um, and again, here, here you see it. 64% of uh, Conservative voters believe Salmond, but 74% of uh, SNP voters believe Sturgeon. That said, of course, um, open division is not helpful to a party. And the SNP still arguably have to worry about the fact that there is still a small group of SNP voters who are not sure that they believe Sturgeon, not sure they think quite as much of the SNP as they did. You know, it might have cost them 3% of the vote, and that 3% could prove to be crucial as uh, I will explain in a moment. Okay, finally, the other thing that we have to bear in mind as to why things have changed as compared with last year is a really old, boring one that journalists uh, certainly tend not to be interested in, but actually there's quite a lot of reason to anticipate from the political science literature, which is simply as an election begins to kick in, old loyalties start to reassert their pull on voters. And some of the polling of these, though not all of it, um, gives you an indication of this. So, for example, this is just showing you uh, how those people who how the support for the SNP broken down by how people voted in the 2019 general election and sharing the picture of A back in November and B the picture now. And in these two polls, at least, you will see that basically the SNP have largely held on to the votes of those people who voted for them back in 2019. The losses have occurred amongst those who didn't vote for them in 2019, which of course is almost undoubtedly the softer vote. And just in what is now a very, very polarized environment, we may be just be to expect that frankly, the SNP was always going to struggle to keep the very high level of support that they had last year. Anyway, where are we at? This is where we are at now, on average in the two votes. Um, the SNP on 48% on the constituency vote, 42% on the list vote, the Tories narrowly ahead on Labour. What might that mean? Well, if you run that through a sausage machine, 64 seats for the SNP, one short of a majority, but given the vagaries of the system, it could be 65, it could be 63, it could be 66. In other words, we go into selection on a knife edge. Now, when it's not on a knife edge so far as who's going to come first. Um, who's going to come first in the election? Well, unless something remarkable happens, the answer to that question is the SNP. But the crucial question is, I think, increasingly acknowledged to be, although the SNP will not acknowledge it, as to whether or not they get an overall majority. If the SNP gets an overall majority, they will be in the same position as that Alex Hammond was in 2011, whereby um, he is, uh, can look to the UK Prime Minister and say, can I have a referendum, please? And on that occasion, the then UK Prime Minister, David Cameron, said, yes, I accept you have the moral right now to hold a referendum. It will be much more difficult for the UK government simply to say no if the SNP on their own replicate the feat of 2011. If the, uh, yes, sure, those on the national side will argue if there's a majority of the SNP with the Greens, um, uh, that that uh, mandate should be respected, but I think it will be much more difficult for the UK government to say no in those circumstances, which is why the overall majority seems to be crucial. And Alex Salmond, uh, sorry, Alex Salmond, Boris Johnson in his speech to the Scottish Virtual Conference last weekend pretty much implicitly admitted as much. But to stand back from all of that potential post-election politics, crucial thing to realise is this is a different election. This is an independence election in a way it's never been. It's also a Brexit election, and it takes place against a backdrop in which uh, Scotland 
certainly is still, despite the more recent decline, registering more support for independence than it ever has done previously in the polls. And to that extent, at least you can appreciate why this election does look like a very substantial challenge for those on the unionist side of the argument. Thanks very much for that, John. Uh, really interesting as always. Um, loads of questions coming in, so thank you everybody for uh, for your questions. I really appreciate that. Um, just to let you all know um, that um, the recording will be available after after the webinar. Um, if you want to point anyone else to it. Um, and as I said at the beginning, we'll be doing um, a number of different articles and podcasts over the next six weeks to talk about the issues that are being discussed um, in the election campaign and what the latest data is telling us about various economic and policy issues. But let's head to questions and I'm just going to ask my colleagues um, to join me. So today we, with us, we've got Emma Congreve, who is Head of um, Poverty and Qualities Analysis at the Institute, David Iser, who's Head of Fiscal Analysis, um, and Stuart McIntyre, who's our head of research. So um, I can put all the, the hard questions to them, John, and give you all the, all the good ones. Um, so there's a number of questions here, um, John, about um, what we know about what voters kind of have in their minds just now when they go to the polls. I <laughs> know that's difficult, but what your research tells you. Um, so for example, um, there's a question around if this is a quasi-referendum on Indy, how many of the issues that I was talking about might actually sort of cut through um, and actually be kind of um, relevant for the outcome? And how, what does the research tell us about um, two things? Firstly, how many undecided voters are there out there? How many people are left to be swayed? And secondly, um, is there a danger that perhaps recent events particularly could, could sort of depress the turnout um, and, and mean that, um, yeah, we just have a lower turnout than we normally would, um, as well as it being obviously more difficult because of the current circumstances. All right, um, I'll take them in reverse order and I might ask you just to quickly remind me of the, yeah. of, of, of the, of the early one. So let's just take the last one. Um, it might be the case that we berate politicians for being politicians and for attacking each other and being creating a, a highly hostile political environment. But of course, one of the things that does is it does also uh, end up politicizing the electorate as well. And we do have now a, a very sharply uh, divided electorate, including, as I said in my talk, an electorate that's divided on issues about which people care and people do care about whether Scott, how Scotland is governed and they do care about, um, uh, 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 about the EU and they also of course care about how the pandemic is being managed. I mean these are all either existential or indeed life or death issues, right? Um, and I, I certainly, you know, one of the interesting things that, you know, despite all the hopes of the advocates of devolution, arguably one of the failures of Scottish Parliament elections to date um, has been not to generate turnouts of a level that has been replicated by uh, Westminster elections, um, even though the 2011 Scottish Parliament election led to the 2014 independence referendum, you therefore might think, uh, which, you know, 85% of people did turn out to vote in, you might therefore think that people would, would get connection. Um, so, I mean, I think the political environment will help, probably help to stimulate turnout because it, we will be focusing about things that are people concerned about. On the other hand, of course, the fact that the campaign is taking place in a pandemic may serve to depress turnout, though we can then have interesting conversations about the, extent, the fact that more people are going to vote by post, whether that does or doesn't uh, 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 push things up. And of course, you know, what is also true, I mean, uh, for those of us who at least who are lucky to be able to live our lives in the digital world, we've learned to live our lives in the digital world and that there will be a, 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 an awful lot of digital campaigning. Um, uh, we, won't, we won't have public meetings, but we will have webinars. I mean, the parties will have webinars like this, right? Okay. Um, and uh, and uh, 
they will be at least as effective as public meetings are, which of course is usually not very effective, but occasionally they are. Um, and otherwise, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be social media, it's going to be uh, uh, television uh, media, etc., by which these, these things get across. Um, I think the second, uh, well, the first one was about what issues of do issues do voters say matter. Well, I should say straight away this is an issue of political contention, and to some degree it depends on how you ask the question. Um, it's long been the case, for example, that if you include the word, if you give people a list of issues that's most important, um, you know, coronavirus, the economy, public services, health service, and independence, and put it on that list, independence is always virtually guaranteed to come bottom of the list. Because some of because what happens is that some of the people who are in favor of independence pick it out, but uh, nobody who's not in favor of independence picks it out, they'll pick out something else. Um, in other words, the problem with that methodology is that you are putting together uh, some of the things that we call valence issues, things where basically everybody kind of broadly, agree. everybody wants a better economy, we might disagree about how to get there, everybody wants good public services, everybody wants to get rid of COVID, but not everybody wants independence, right? So putting those two things together in the same list, you know, it doesn't work. Um, the, so I'll then give you two further answers. The answer that I would always give you as to what as to whether an issue matters or not is the evidence I presented in the talk, which is it's basically discriminatory power. So as social scientists, we prefer, or at least as quantitative social scientists, we prefer to infer motivation, uh, uh, not simply by what people say, because people don't necessarily always know what their motivations are, but actually by looking at relationships. And the truth is that when you've got that relationship of 87% of people who believe in one thing voting for a party and only 7% on the other, that is extraordinarily strong. I mean, if I, if I were to put a question on nationalization in a poll, um, I would not get as much discriminatory power between Conservative and Labour as I do on, on that question. It's a very extraordinarily strong relationship. But in fact, also, um, Ipsos Mori did do uh, in their most recent poll, Rather than just putting in saying independence, they kind of put, you know, how Scotland should be governed, stroke devolution, stroke independence as a option, all right, together with public services, health, etc. And in that, even voters themselves said, picked out how Scotland should be governed more than any other item. And indeed, here indeed is one issue upon which Conservative voters and SNP voters agree. They both agree that the constitutional question is the most important. You know, the Conservatives have managed to bang on about it so much in the last four years, they have indeed succeeded in persuading people that it's an important subject, right? Despite the fact that, of course, in banging on about it in the last four years, they've been trying to tell us it's not an important subject, right? But of course, if you keep on mentioning it, you've helped to raise its salience. Um, uh, the, 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 the group of people who are less keen on it are Labour voters, um, but, you know, what a, the, the, the Labour Party faces an election, the same strategic dilemma that the party faced before 2019, and it faces now. The Labour Party is desperate for politics, both north and south of the border, to return to issues of left versus right, inequality, public services. And that's also reflected in the views of those people who are still left uh, voting for the Labour Party. The Labour Party's problem, however, is that its coalition has been fractured, by Brexit on both sides of the border, but Brexit is not a left-right issue, it's a social liberal versus social conservative issue. Um, and the Labour coalition has also been fractured by independence. So Anna Sawa's message is, could we please talk about something else? Because he, like Keir Starmer, doesn't want to talk about Brexit and he doesn't want to talk about independence, but you can see the challenge, all right? Yes, for some, uh, for, you know, uh, and then, me, but then the the other answer then, of course, is that really, when you kind of give people this choice, of course, what's going to happen in the campaign is that the protagonist will make different connections between these various substantive issues and their constitutional preference. Okay, so if you, I mean, it's not this is not difficult, right? If, you said this is some of your own presentation. If you are a independent supporter you are going to say the only way we're going to get out of this mess is by having the powers of independence 
and be able to sort this out for itself. And we'll get rid of the inequ terrible inequalities that COVID has revealed, because the Tory government will never do it. If on the other hand, you're on the union side, you're obviously saying this is completely the last time to do it. And we need the pooling and sharing of resources to an even greater extent now than we had in the past. And this is the only way to, uh, so in other words, there will be substantive connections made with the, uh, with, with the constitutional question. But of course, the constitutional questions, both Brexit and independence are also about, um, about questions of identity. But I think certainly, I mean, one thing in a sense, I think it is reasonable to worry about is that, you know, if I'm right that basically voters' minds are on Brexit, independence and the coronavirus, it may, the risk is that A, as it were, everything that the Scottish government has or hasn't done before March 2020 is just gonna get wiped off everybody's memory slate and equally, the, their attention on, as it were, how Scotland might best be governed within the existing devol devolution framework, as more recently amended in a variety of recent ways, both by the 2016 Scotland Act and by then by more recent uh, legislation passed by the UK government. I mean, again, the question is how much space there will be for some of those issues. And, you know, even if you are in favour of independence and you are reasonably optimistic about the time frame, it's probably going to be true that at least for the vast majority of the next five year term, we are talking about Scotland still being governed within the framework of that settlement. And then, you know, should these issues begin to kick in, question mark. Yeah, it was really interesting and you, you covered a lot of ground there and actually a lot of questions people are asking like in you, John, so that's fantastic. Um, so coming to one of those those um, substantive issues then, um, um, Emma, if you could, um, we talked about um, child poverty and the challenges um, and we've had a few questions in about, um, you know, the, the sorts of things that the Scottish government could do in the future, a future Scottish government could do to, to deal with these things and, and how how likely it is they can sort of um, gain traction in the wake of the, the pandemic and the challenges that that poses. And sure, thanks, Mary. So yeah, I, I mean, taking a bit of a step back and, and thinking about this um, uh, child poverty as, a, as, an, as an issue, it's one that the entire parliament, um, you know, they all voted for the, the Child Poverty Act back in uh, 2017. So it's something that we all agree on um, in the parliament and expect it in the next one as well, that it, it's something that needs to, needs to change. And, um, you know, we have one in four children in Scotland who, who are currently living below the poverty line. So um, the kind of the type of Scotland that, um, well, particularly this Scottish government talks about um, that we want to live in is, you know, does, does not correspond to having one in four children um, living in poverty. So it's a huge issue. And of course, there are huge gains um, right now and in the future to, if this is tackled in terms of, you know, other priorities like educational attainment, health inequalities, you know, um, sort of uh, sort of better well-being for the population as a whole. So, so there's a lot in this, and and the the targets that were set. Um, there is a set of interim targets due in the next parliament. I think you mentioned that at the start, Mary, um, to get child poverty down quite significantly by 23, 24. Um, I suppose the good news is that it is possible within the current Scottish powers. Um, you know, as I say, we're going to be within the same um, devolved settlement probably from the next parliamentary terms. So it is possible to use the combination of new social security powers, along with, um, you know, uh, powers on, on, on housing and on uh, skills and training and active labour market policies like childcare and transport. You know, the tools are all there, at least to get us to the interim targets. Um, but it does require substantial investment. And, and I think that's, that's, um, the issue that all we'll have to grapple with that um, we've had a lot of um, ambitions from this government and you know that's great but actually getting the, the hard um, policies in place with the enough money attached to them requires um, prioritize, reprioritization probably of what's in the budget or it requires an increase in, in taxation so you know these aren't um, easy questions but they do need to be grapples with in order to meet um, the child poverty targets in, in the next few years. 
Yeah, and related to that, if I can come to you, David, there's been a few questions about the outlook for how much money um, a future Scottish government may have to spend. Um, and obviously there's um, a debate, as I mentioned, potentially about fiscal consolidation in the future. Um, what, what might the UK government do and how it might change? How um, There's a couple of questions. One, sort of how challenging do you think it is for um, parties, I guess, to set out what their plans might be, um, given the uncertain nature of the outlook for the, the budget. And also there's a specific question about um, the kind of kind of controversy over um, the consequentials that have been passed through on COVID and whether they've all been spent. So could you just kind of clear up what we know about that, if that's all right? Sure, yes. So <clears throat> although um, Scotland does now have quite significant tax powers, it is still the case that it's the, the block grant from Westminster that really determines the shape, the size of the, the Scottish government's uh, spending envelope. The plans set out by the UK government in, in the March budget imply that um, the Scottish government's resource block grant will be increasing by about 2% per year in real terms over the next a uh, few years to 2025-26. So on one level that's not austerity in a in a technical sense, um, although it does imply I think quite significant constraints in terms of the choices that the future Scottish Government uh, will have. Um, and one of the other things that the UK Government's plans basically imply is that Covid in a year's time will have gone away and, and isn't going to sort of need any further public services spending. So if those plans, if those UK government plans are realized, um, it's not austerity in a technical sense, uh, but it is a fairly constraint, constraining um, settlement. Um, and I mean, that suggests that there's actually a good chance that those plans aren't realized. And in fact, um, the block grant for resource spending does it, in fact, end up increasing more than those plans set out. But that does then illustrate the challenges that the Scottish parties um, face in, in putting sort of very specific numbers forward in their, in their manifesto proposals. And it's why what we tend to see is um, commitments framed in such a way that they... Um, they're actually framed to sound quite significant in the way that they're sort of placed in in terms of cash increases multiplied over many years but, but actually they're erring on the side of caution in many ways um uh so sorry the second part of the question was about consequentials and the extent to which they they're, they're passed on um, and they've been kind of spent as well because there's been some controversy about that yeah yeah, so the first issue, I suppose, is on the extent to which the COVID consequentials have been allocated. And basically, they have all been allocated, albeit that quite a large chunk of them, of the, of the consequentials for the 2021 financial year, have been uh, transferred into the 21-22 financial year. That's really because they, they came along very late in the 2021 financial year, and the UK government allowed the Scottish Government to sort of extend its usual uh, powers to, to transfer those resources between financial years. So the allocation is basically um, all, all, all allocations, all, all the Barnet consequentials have been allocated. The question about the, uh, the extent to which some of those funds have or haven't been spent, uh, I mean, the comprehensive picture, we is going to have to wait a bit until full audits and so on. But um, I think generally the picture is that by and large, um, a large, the the uh, vast majority of the allocated funds have been uh, have been spent. There have been some, as you would expect, um, some issues with some funds where things have been slightly underspent. Um, and then have been rolled into subsequent uh, funding streams. But by and large, um, the consequentials have been allocated in full and the vast majority of the allocated spending has happened. Okay, thanks, David. Just coming back to you, John, it's a little bit of a change of pace, but um, there's quite a lot of questions about, about Labour and, and the, the, the bump maybe they'll, they'll get from having a new leader and whether there's any evidence for that. 
and whether you have any research to show whether there's support for, I guess, a, a third way, uh, a, you know, a, a more substantial p um, package of devolution, um, uh, if you know, and, and what voters think about that. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think it's already the case that um, Anas Sawa has a higher recognition factor than Richard Leonard because, of, of course, Richard Leonard's fundamental problem is that he struggled to make an impact on the electorate. And we were still getting some polls uh, where 50% of people said, I just don't know how well or badly Richard Leonard is doing. Uh, Anna Sawa, of course, starts with the advantage um, of already being at least a slightly well-known uh, politician in at least some quarters, having previously been deputy leader of uh, Labour Party. And of course, his father was the first um, Muslim MP anywhere inside the UK. So he's, he's also a little bit of a political dynasty. Um, but inevitably, it's early days. So you still get 30, 40% of people saying don't know. And he start, and inevitably amongst all voters, he starts off with negative numbers. And he, I think I just checked the other day, I think he's got something like, um, you know, half of Labour voters or so thinking he's doing a good job, but it's still only half. And, you know, the equivalent figure for Nicola Sturgeon is well into the 80s. Um, so, the, I mean, the, you know, the answer is it, it really will depend on his, per, on, on his uh, performance um, as to uh, how well he can uh, comport himself, how well he can grab people's attention, and particularly above all, how far he can persuade people. Indeed, uh, I mean, you know, one of the um, most insightful things that um, I ever heard about Scottish politics was, was from the late um, Bill Miller, who was uh, who started his political science career at Strathclyde before moving to another university uh, slightly further down the road. Um, uh, and he, and he, this was his bill talking in the 1990s, saying, well, you know, what you have to understand about the Labour Party is that, you know, much like the Liberal Democrats in England, they're the centre party of Scottish politics. And that's, if it was true then, it's certainly very much true now. You know, the Labour Party, you know, insofar as anybody who's in favour of independence who isn't going to vote for the SNP, it's the Labour Party they vote for. So the Labour Party's vote, uh, if you ask people whether they believe Salmond or Sturgeon, half the Labour voters believe Salmond and half of them believe Sturgeon, whereas the Tory voters are all quite clear uh, that, they, that they believe Salmond, etc. So Labour is undoubtedly the bridge party. And I think in truth, you know, one of the dirty secrets of this election, although it is one that the Scottish Conservatives do absolutely their damnness to deny, perhaps in the end to their own disadvantage, is that if anybody is going to deny the SNP a majority, it is the Labour Party. Voters are much more likely to switch between Labour and the SNP than they are between the SNP and the Conservatives, uh, not least because um, uh, quite a lot of people who voted for the SNP have voted for the Labour Party in the past. Um, uh, and the Scottish Conservatives berating the Labour Party for not being as unionist as them uh, might help to depress the Labour vote, but that's not what the game is about. The game is about is who can actually win over votes from the SNP. I think the answer to that the answer to that, if it's anybody, is going uh, 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 to be Labour. Um, but on the, on the constitutional question itself, I think the problem that is now faced is there is no doubt. If we go back to 2012, 2013, you will all remember all the debates about Devo Max. The Scottish government was minded to consider whether or not Devo Max should be on the ballot paper. But in the end, uh, the UK government said no. And the UK government said no because it reckoned the SNP was going to get hammered in the referendum and they did not want to give them the consolation prize of winning uh, a, a vote in favour of more devolution, which at that point seemed to be the most popular option. The problem now is that pu public opinion has got so uh, polarised between independence versus the status quo um, and the status quo that perhaps has become a bit more anti than it was. Um, is that, I mean, there's been a couple of polls recently that have indeed asked people, how would you vote between the current position, the, um, uh, the independence and uh, more devolution, and more devolution comes third, quite clearly. And again, you know, this is back to the problem of the Remainers, right? The, the, the Tories do not back more devolution. The Labour Party does. 
um, in, in much the same way as you know, half the Remainers wanted a Norway type solution and another half wanted a, another referendum. And now the train would meet and therefore the result was that Scott, the UK le le left the European Union. Um, and you know, it, it's long, I mean, it's long been a, a problem for the Union side. It was a problem for the Union side in 2014, but it's now uh, very, very clearly there. Um, and but the problem for the Labour Party is that it's the constitutional path down which is it's now sailing is one that, well, you know, perhaps it was quite a well laden ship in harbour in 2012, but alas, it's since seemingly sailed quite a long way out of the harbour and seems to have sailed over the horizon. Okay, well, staying on the ship theme, um, I'll go. Um, the to Stuart, just briefly, uh, if you would, Stuart, just given the time, um, the, there's a few questions about Brexit and the recent disruption that we've seen to trade, which has happened in the early part of this year um, after we've laid the transition uh, period. And there's some questions about whether that's kind of what we might have expected to see, how much of that might be um, temporary or um, long lasting. Um, and what that might mean for, I guess, Scotland thinking about trading with the EU vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis trading with the rest of the UK and then in any sort of future independence referendum and, and the issues that that might raise. So a short answer on a massive issue. Um, yeah. I, I, I think there's a couple of things to unpick here. If you reflect back on the Brexit debate such as it was, small parts of the economy like fishing um, which is a really smart, small part of, of the UK economy, of the Scottish economy, but incredibly important in certain um, localities across the UK, particularly in Scotland. You know, some small communities are hugely dependent on, um, on jobs in, in the fishing industry. Um, it got a massively disproportionate amount of attention. And we've seen that through the early months of 2021, massive amounts of um, emphasis placed on disruption to um, the, the fishing um, exports to, to the EU. Um, I, mean, I think more generally, we've seen disruption um, take place. It was forecast there was going to be disruption in trade as we, we, we move from one regime to another. Um, it seems to have calmed down a bit as, as businesses are, are adjusting. That will continue. Um, I think the point to be made here on the parallels between Brexit and Scottish independence with respect to trade is just scale. You know, 60% of Scotland's exports don't go to the EU, they go to the rest of the UK. By contrast, 20% of our exports go to the EU. Um, now, that's data from a couple of years ago, but it won't fundamentally have changed. So by far and away, the rest of the UK is our largest trading partner. And I think as we've lived through the Brexit debate, we can see how unwinding very complex trade relationships create some really clear challenges. So I think in any future constitutional debate, one of the key issues is going to be setting out very clearly how that future trade relationship might work. Because I think we have a much better understanding now of it's not some abstract idea, it's a, a set of very tangible and practical challenges that will have to be faced if we erect trade barriers with our, our, our neighbours. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Um, and John, just one final question for you, given the time, if that's okay. Um, there's some questions about, about the voting system uh, for, the, <laughs> for the Scottish Parliament and that it was sort of designed to um, it did not um, give one party a majority yeah. um, in terms of the regional and then the list votes, um, the constituency in, in list votes. Um, so um, do you have any view on whether this is sort of well known and understood um, and what happened in 2011 to overcome that? Um, and there, there has been some debate about potential changes to the voting system. Um, I don't know if that's cutting through to voters or, or concerning their minds. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the, the, there is no doubt that uh, one of the reasons behind the choice was to try to make it impossible for the SNP to win an overall majority. Uh, now, while uh, the system is not perfect at uh, that, it, 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 it it, 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 the, the quite a lot of disproportionately arises from the fact that you've got to get about 6% of the vote before you're going to start picking up seats in a region. Um, so it's easy for votes to be wasted. 
Um, that does therefore mean that, you know, as was the case in 2011, once you get 45% of the vote or above, you've got a chance of getting an overall majority. You don't need 50. On the other hand, um, to, to move from that to say, oh, it's ineffective, uh, no. Just imagine if this election were taking place under first past the post. The SNP would walk it, as indeed, of course, they have recently been walking Westminster elections. Um, because once the SNP became the most popular party in Scotland, uh, its geographically evenly spread vote, which was hitherto a major disadvantage, became a major advantage. Um, and you know, ju just to roll you, uh, give you a thought to think forward. Um, well, I'll answer your point about SDV, and then I'll do the point well forward. Um, so, uh, sure, there is th th there are uh, all sorts of arguments about the merits of the system. Of course, it was spatchcocked onto an existing first past the post system because a lot of parties wish to keep uh, elements of what they're familiar. The alternative, inevitably, about which we talk about is going is going to be the single S the SDV system, which we, we use for local government. Um, but uh, but for that, you've got to get rid of single member constituencies. Um, it's potentially could be more proportional in the current system, but only if we have relatively large constituencies, and that is where in the debate will lie. The, the system we have for local government is not that proportional because the, because the ward size is too small. And with PR systems, it's constituency size that's crucial. So it, it, we would have to swallow the, really the idea of losing the local MSP if we were going to do that. But then leave you one final thought on, on, on the electoral system and referendums, et cetera. Uh, there is, of course, uh, an assumption that um, if the SNP can be stopped from having a referendum, that's it, uh, game over. Well, it's worth reminding ourselves where the idea of having a referendum as the pathway to independence comes from. It comes from the SNP in the 1990s as a device for trying to ensure that voters who were not in favour of independence would nevertheless vote for the SNP in devolved elections. Prior to that, the SNP's position was that if we get a majority of the seats in either the Scottish seats at Westminster or of the um, seats in a future devolved parliament, we will regard that as a mandate to negotiate for independence. It, uh, now, point one, I've already shown you that the SNP are no longer reliant to get very high levels of support on winning over the support of people who are not in favor of independence. So that, that change is not just of interest to this election, it's a major strategic, it's a major change in the strategic positioning of uh, the nationalists uh, in the pursuit of independence. And I think what one should anticipate, at least consider the possibility is that if the SNP are indeed effectively denied a majority in the next two or three years, assuming they get a majority, that they may well switch to the previous policy. And it's a lot easier for the SNP to get a majority of the Westminster seats at, uh, for Scotland in 2024 than it will ever be to win a referendum and that also there is still quite a serious risk that future uh, UK parliaments will be a hung parliament in which perhaps the SNP will have the balance of power. So um, as, as unionists consider about what they should do if there were to be an SNP majority, uh, they do need to think forward as to how uh, the SNP might react. And certainly Joanna Cherry has already cited the outcome of the UK election of 1918 in Ireland as the precedent for why. Uh, uh, so if you don't like the precedent of a referendum, unfortunately, there's another precedent around that says actually winning a UK election in the territory is also potentially a mandate for independence. Wow, what a, great, what a great note to finish on. Thanks for that, John. Um, I, thank you so much for your time today, John. Really appreciate it. Um, it's been really useful, really interesting. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get around all the questions, everyone. So many interesting things that have got me thinking about what we cover over the next six weeks as we, we get to the run-up of the uh, election. Um, we're, as I said, we're going to be publishing loads of stuff, so, um, so go to our website and, and look out for our podcasts and articles on various issues um, and, and get in touch if you're interested in discussing any particular issues with us. Um, so I'd just like to say again, thank you so much to John and thank you to my colleagues from, from the Fraser for joining me. 
Um, everybody take care uh, and we'll see you all again soon for the next Fraser Valander webinar. Thank you very much.